the 26th of October, 1967. The Hall of Mirrors in the Gulistan Palace in Tehran. The Shah of Iran places a blazing crown studded with regal jewels on the head of his queen and proclaims her Empress of Iran. A historical day for Iran and a momentous one in the life of Fatah Pahlavi. In the 2,500 year history of Iran, Fatah Pahlavi is the first woman to be so singularly honored. I think that uh, when my husband crowned me the Empress of Iran, uh, it was not a personal matter only. He wanted by that symbolically honor all the women of Iran. And uh, for that reason, I was very proud and happy, not only for myself, but as a symbol, uh, as the representative of women of our country, which for years have been put aside any of any participation in the life of the country. The Shah wants to make Iran a modern industrial country by the turn of the century. He has only one way to raise the money, get a high price for oil. It's true that when we started to defend our interests, the price of commodities also rocketed up by several hundred percent. But uh, this cannot continue. If you increase, we increase. If we increase, you increase. We have got to find some solution for this. People in Britain, some of them cold, some of them quite poor, will be asking themselves what it is that you and certainly some of your Arab counterparts, sheikhs and rulers and governments, have against them. Are you? Does it in any way serve your interests well, why, to, why, to, why? To, to make a British economy suffer? And well, why against? First of all, it's not British economy. If you want to say anything, it should be the world economy. And this is not against. We are just defending our chips. Uh, because for such a long time, we have just been, uh, well, exploited, I can say that. And uh, why don't you say that when... Uh, the price of uh, wheat was augmented by 300 percent. They had something against us. We had to buy it, or soya bean, or steel products, or petrochemical products, which in some cases have augmented by 30 times. So did you have anything against us when you augmented those prices? Or what I buy from you, even weapons, the price that you are charging today is not what you were charging two months ago. It's increasing. Have you something against us? If you continue this way, a permissive, undisciplined society, you are going to blow up. And uh, in matter of fact... How do you mean blow up? I'm not quite clear what you mean by that. Well, you will go bankrupt. You're not going to help us not to go bankrupt if you put the price of oil in here. I won't be a good friend of yours if I did help you uh, being... Uh, uh, not aware of the seriousness of the situation. The brown-eyed peoples are teaching the blue-eyed peoples something, is that? Well, no, we, really, we are not teaching something. The blue-eyed people have to wake up. Wake up to? From their complacency to 
for this torpor in which they put themselves. I think that our, our country in the next 10 years will be what you are today. In the next 25 years, according to other people, I'm not saying that, will be among the five most prosperous countries of the world. مثل با هجاب رو که او هم راه پیمایی کرد در کنارش منم راه پیمایی کردم اگر ده بار او راه پیمایی کرد منم ده بار راه پیمایی کردم پس تا اینجا با هم مساوی هستیم چرا الان باید من رو از او جدا کنم شاهد تظاهرات و راه پیمایی بود گروهی از زنان و مردانی که در دانشگاه تهران اجتماع کرده بودند در این تظاهرات وجود داشت گروه هایی که موافق هجاب بودند و گروه های مخالف هجاب و همچنین کسانی که طرفتار آزادی زن هستند فریاد میزنند که ما اختناق اختناق است آزادی نیست چه شد است که آزادی نیست نمیذارن این آخوندا زن و مردا با هم تو دریا برن به غلطن این آخوندا نمیذارن که این جوانای ما آزاد باشن برن در مشروب خانه ها و در قمار خانه ها و در فحشا فرو برن آزادی نیست اینا نمیذارن که رادیو تلویزیون ما زنای لخت نشان بوده و اون وجه فقیه را وزیه را قبیه را و بچه ها و جوان های ما را مشغول کنن این یه آزادی وارداتی است که از قرب آمده است آزادی استعماری است یعنی ممالک مستعمره را دیخته کردن به اون آیی که خائن به مملکت هستند به اینکه ترویج این آزادی ها را بکنیم Thousands of women across Iran came together to celebrate International Women's Day in 1979 is empty Revolution is meaningless without women's freedom We do not want hijab March 8, 1979, women around Tehran were discussing the new events of imposition of hijab ordered by Ayatollah Khomeini. A woman said, demonstration against hijab is an opportunity for women to be in solidarity with each other. 
Hijab is people's issue. It is unbelievable. Always men defend hijab. We want to fight back. We have to speak up right now for our rights. Otherwise, when they write the constitutional laws, it will be too late. First they impose the hijab, and then other discriminations will come. They'll impose restrictions on marriage and divorce, and finally will force us to stay at home.
For nearly 40 years, Iran has required all women, citizen or visitor, to cover their hair and wear long, loose garments. The morality police, similar to Saudi Arabia's religious police, detain violators and escort them to a police van, where family members are called for a change of clothes and violators must promise to dress appropriately. For repeat or egregious offenses, the morality police require the violator take a modesty class, levy fine, or send them to prison. Last year, the police in the capital, Tehran, deployed 7,000 thousand officers to enforce the dress code. But in the wave of recent anti-regime protests, an opportunity was provided for the Iranian women to push forward their campaign of the right to freedom of expression. Vida Mavahed, a 31-year-old mother, stood atop a utility box on Tehran's bustling Inglab Street and removed her hijab, tied it to a stick, and silently waved it like a flag. She was subsequently arrested and detained for a month. Her silent message, that women should have the freedom to choose to wear the head covering or not, spread quickly on social media and ignited a wave of similar demonstrations. Dozens of women have been arrested, some of whom face up to 10 years in prison, on charges of committing a sinful act, violating public prudency, and encouraging immorality or prostitution. I grew up in a small village. That's why I think America is too big for me. As a kid, my brother was an example of freedom, was a symbol of freedom that I didn't have it. That how he was free to run in a green, lovely farm without a scarf. How he was free to ride a bicycle in a nice village. My village is the best. I started to, to publish this one, me and me. So that's why people started to send their picture. Then I asked women to share their experiences, which they did. Some of the picture coming from those young girls saying that they just want to feel the wind through their hair. It's a simple demand like this. It's forbidden. To be like this is forbidden in Iran. From the age of seven, Masay Alinejad wore the hijab even within her family home, according to the wishes of her traditional family. But she says she always felt the discomfort. She started to remove it in private when her father was not around. Five years ago, she posted a photo of herself without hijab whilst driving in Lebanon. She described the simple freedom of feeling the wind in her hair for the first time, which later became the name of her book. This photo sparked a social media liberation movement, inspiring women throughout Iran to remove their hijabs publicly and post it online. The online movement, My Stealthy Freedom, has gained millions of followers worldwide. White Wednesdays invite women to protest the compulsory hijab law. But the move was not without its complications. She insists she's not against the hijab, but rather in favour of choice, not law, for Iranian women. And Masa Alinejad joins us now from New York. It's nice to have you on the show, Masa. You said that the hijab felt wrong from a very early age. I'm wondering what that sense was, where it came from. Um, first of all, I have to say that um, from the age of seven, millions of girls in Iran, they have to wear a um, headscarf when they start a school. And if you don't wear it, then you won't be able to get an education. For me, uh, it was a personal experience to wear hijab even inside the house because I grew up in a traditional family. But hijab became a political issue in Iran as well. It's like after the revolution, the Islamic Republic of Iran got our bodies like a hostage and we had to carry the most visible symbol of Islamic Republic on our bodies. And if you say no to compulsory hijab, then you won't be able to go to university, you won't be able to get a job, you won't be able to, to live in your own country. Mm. So for me, first, I just started to take, I mean, I always say that I started my own revolution from my own kitchen. And then I started to take off my black uh, long chador inside Iran. And I was taking off my hijab every uh, time when the police were not around, when my father was not around in Iran. Why do but you think... But when I first time... 
Sorry, just to ask, why do you think it is such an important rule in Iran? I, I heard it said that, you know, when the regime is at its more relaxed, then women start to show their fringe, and when it's at its most rigid, then the hijab comes further down onto the forehead. Why do you think this has become such a symbol of authority? Um, I strongly believe that three pillars, main pillars, actually is really important for Islamic Republic of Iran to keep them. One is death to America, the other one is death to Israel, and uh, third is um, hijab. But nowadays, for Islamic Republic of Iran, the women inside Iran are the biggest threat because this is the, the, actually the tool that they can control the whole society, not only women. Um, compulsory hijab is just a wall, the first step. And, and beyond that, there are more discriminatory laws. When you are unveiled, then you cannot have a mixed party with you, men. You can get lashes. You can get arrested. You cannot, you know, um, get, as I told you, get a job because you are unveiled. So for the government of Iran, this is even more than, you know, it's a biggest threat than the American is right as well. Because if you are unveiled, then you have to be um, in prison. You have to, you know, be kicked out from and, the country. You have been outspoken. You've been vocal. You've posted photos and you've started your own revolution, the White Wednesdays, as we heard. What creates a tipping point now? Uh, because you're not against the hijab, you're just against the law enforcement of it. What would create a tipping point that would give enough Iranian women whatever is that bravery uh, to over overturn it? You know, as I told you, um, uh, this is actually the government trying to make, uh, you know, men against uh, women, using men to oppress women. So nowadays, through these campaigns and social media, women found their agency, found themselves powerful. So they're actually um, doing a punishable crime in public to say no to compulsory job, and men are joining them. And uh, as I told you, uh, in my campaign, women got arrested just because of uh, protesting against uh, uh, compulsory hijab laws and 29 women got arrested by the Islamic Republic of Iran and after that when they got released on bail those brave women went inside the court and took off, take off their, they took off their headscarf and they said that we are not going to keep silent even when you're uh, you, threatening me. You don't, so, think, you don't think you're fighting against something that women actually choose to do uh, as a powerful and important part of their own Iranian culture? Let me, let me make it clear for you. My mom wears hijab. My sister wears hijab. In fact, all the female in my family, they wear hijab. So when I, I so many uh, you know, times when I go to media, I get often this question that, are you against Islam? Are you against hijab? But I have to say that this is Islamic laws which is against me and millions of Iranian women inside Iran. Sharia laws, actually. You know, I, as a woman, uh, according to Islamic law, I am not uh, allowed to sing solo. I'm not allowed to show my hair. I'm not allowed to dance. I'm not allowed to be a judge. I'm not allowed to get a custody of my child. I'm not allowed to get permission in, without getting permission from my father or my husband to travel abroad. So this is so clear that we are not against those women who choose to wear hijab, but all the Islamic laws are against me and millions of Iranian women and some people in the West might say that you know by talking about compulsory job you're causing Islamophobia but yeah. these are the discriminatory laws causing Islamophobia that is why my, my, I mean, for, uh, our goal in our campaign is now to invite all Masa. the Western feminists, especially female politicians, to, uh, you know, challenge compulsory job laws when they go inside Iran. Masa, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. They wear hijab. This is not a black and white issue. All family in Iran is not like my family. There are so many families who do not believe in compulsory hijab. Iran is for all Iranians. You cannot just hide one side of Iran and show the other side of Iran and saying that this is Iran. This is a lie. Iran is me and my mother. My mother wants to wear a scarf. I don't want to wear a scarf. Iran should be for both of us.